By the end of this assignment, only one will have fulfilled his mission to become the Master Spy. <laughs> With Jenny Lee Wright as the inscrutable Miss Moneypacker, here now is the man in control, your resident spymaster, William Franklin. To secret agents, espionage can be a lucrative career. It can also be a short one. At 2.27 this morning, we received a frantic radio message. This was it. On that brief message depends a vital part of our national security and the four operatives specially chosen to save the situation will need to be fearless and far-sighted. Moneypacker, could we have the first agent in for screening? Certainly, Major. Agent Campbell Laurie is 32 years old. He's married with two children and he works for a Scottish newspaper. Good evening, Laurie. Good to have you with us. There you go. Now, 14 years in Africa, that was quite a while. What were you doing there? I don't think I'd better tell you too much about that, really. I see. That's still under wraps, is it? Good. Uh, African languages, I understand you've learned a couple. Well, living with them, I have picked up a little bit of the chatter. Yes. To, what particular language? Well, the one basic international language yeah. in Africa, apart from Swahili, is Jalapalapa. Jalapalapa. Yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> because when people came from all sorts of African countries to work in the one place, yes. the South African mines, they had to find a common language which everyone could understand. So yes. they invented Jalapalapa. Which is a mixture of slang, a mixture of Swahili, it's Urdu, a... whatever was going. Exactly. I see. Uh, you also, I notice, uh, part of your hobbies is playing bridge. Yeah. What convention do you play? Um, Arkol or Goran? One club. <laughs> yes, that's fair enough, actually. That's even better than I play. I must be honest well, about that. Now, uh, I just want to take you through something. Secret documents uh, are always kept behind locked doors. Sometimes the locks are sophisticated, ingenious, and this door here is fitted with a trans-vocal security lock, Mark II, and it'll only open when you activate this microphone by tuning those two dials and talking continuously into the microphone. That then comes through the speaker and releases that door. And do you understand? It's a synchronization test, really. You have 20 seconds to release that door from now. Right, well, I'll just uh, start off trying this uh, dial here because... Uh to get the best uh, conversation that way, talking around like that. And there's nothing so far, so I'll just talk to myself a little bit. That was it? That's I got it, it now. now. Yes, you have indeed. Now, we jump from that uh, test to something else, this book. Anything odd about it, as far as you're concerned? Take a look at there's it. There's a misspelling. What's that? Maddening. Absolutely right. Far from the madding crowd by Thomas Hardy. Now, inside that book is a piece of paper with your initials on it. I'd like you to find it. Is it there? Yes. Now, I'd like you to return to base over there and take the piece of paper and I'd like you to eat it. I am actually quite serious. It's part of your mission. Flavored? Flavor vanilla. <laughs> Agent David Hearn, who was born in London, is an advertising executive. He's single, 21, and he works in Newcastle upon Tyne. Hello, Hearn. Good evening, 
Good you. to see you. I'm glad you could make the trip from the Northeast. I notice amongst your names, Lovett Gordon. Now, that suggests a military background, perhaps a history in the family. Well, yes, I think at the last count it was about 163 I had to knock off before I got the title. Was this of Lord Lovett? Uh, yes, yes, sir. I see, yes. And, I see. And the Gordon Highlanders were sort of thrown in as a sort of second. Oh, yes, yeah, they're just cousins. Oh, I see. Now, I'm going to put an idea to you. You're on an aeroplane going on holiday to Prague. And the chief steward comes up to you, and he says that it's absolutely essential that you help him because he's in intelligence. You are to collect the document in Prague and return to London with it. Now, you're not in intelligence at the time. The whole thing is just thrown into your lap. It's an emergency. First of all, I like your thoughts on it, and then how you deal with it. Well, I think I'd want to make sure the, uh, the steward was straight, and uh, I'd ask him, I think, a question that all true Englishmen could answer. Where do you buy your underwear now? All Englishmen would answer the same store. Let's face it. Yes, fine, all right. We won't go into that quite no, at the moment. Right. <laughs> now, given the fact he gave the right answer, if he was to give me a sufficiently voluptuous assistant, I'd go anywhere. I see. It's as simple as that. You can actually be bought. Oh, yes. Very simple. Not with money. Not with money. No, I see. It might make your career in our department a little dodgy, but in the meantime, we'll put you through a, a few other little tests. Now, to open this door here, you have to adjust those two dials so that when you speak into the microphone, your voice comes through that speaker. It's a synchronization test. Are you quite clear what I mean? Absolutely. Right, you have 20 seconds to release that door. Well, they said to me I shouldn't panic when I did this, and I seem to be succeeding. I'm just yes, you did indeed get through very quickly. Excellent. Now, something uh, a little more light-hearted. Vanity Fair, yes. William Makepeace Thackeray. Notice anything? Strange about that cover? Uh, yes, the title spelt wrong. Yes, which part of the title? Fair. Absolutely right. Inside there, you'll find a piece of paper with your initials on it. I'd like you to find it. Oh. Ah, yes. Now, if you'd like to return to base, join your colleague, would you like to take the piece of paper with you? I would like you to digest it bodily. It is part of your mission. I see. Fine. It's quite tasty. Thank you. <laughs> Agent Carol Harris comes from London and she works as a private secretary to a company director. Harris, make yourself quite comfortable. Thank you, Major. Now, you have an interest which is a little unusual, I would have thought, for a, a gal. Uh, you make stained glass windows. Well, small ones for very small rooms. Small rooms, not in the sense we mean domestically. Oh, yes, definitely. Oh, yes, could you give me some examples? Well, there was one in Cleethorpes that I did, and another one in Swindon. And... These public lavatories, to be exact. Well, yes, actually. I see, and you make the stained glass windows that go in there, and I also yes. see you do the upholstery. You <laughs> yes. make this comfortable as well. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, well, I'm delighted. Now, to take you into another aspect of what could be your possible life, if I came and told you tomorrow, that you are to go to a Bulgarian nunnery for six months because a British agent who delivers bread there every day under another guise has lost his contact. How would you explain this cover story to your employers and all your friends and your family? Well, my mother always needs fresh bread. So I would explain to her that the very best bread came from Bulgaria. Yes. It's going to take quite a while, but you're going to be in Bulgaria for six months, you see, in this nunnery. Oh, in the nunnery. Yeah, yes, I'm afraid you are in the nunnery. Yeah. That may not actually have a great deal of appeal for you, but that's the job. Well, Mother would approve of that. She yeah. thinks that's where I belong, really. I see. Right. All right. Uh, let us tease you a little more and to say that to open this door, you must adjust these two dials so that when you speak into the microphone, your voice comes through that speaker. It's a synchronization test. Do you understand that quite clearly? Right, well, you have 20 seconds to release that door. You're probably wondering where I got my suntan. Yes, I am, as a matter of fact. I've just come back from Ibiza. Yes. Where it was really beautifully sunny all day long. Yes. And I lay in the sun. Go on. And I'm not doing very well with this test. That's all right. It happens in the end. Just keep going. Do, do keep talking. Hello. Yes, yes, you made it. You made it. Now. There's a book, fairly obviously, but not what is not quite so obvious, perhaps, is uh, the oddity on the cover. I don't believe John Goldsworthy wrote Hard Times. It was written by Charles Dickens. You're absolutely right. And inside that book is a piece of paper with your initials on it. Would you find it for me?
Yes, you made it. <laughs> Would you like to join your colleagues over there? And on the way over, I'd like you to eat that. It is part of your mission. Thank you. <laughs> Agent Edwin Spencer is a 42-year-old sales manager. He comes from Birmingham and he's married with two children. Hello, Spencer. Good evening, my Good evening. The last will be first, and the first will be last, and all that sort of thing. I'm sorry you had to wait so long, but you're a rifleman, aren't you? I am indeed, yes. Yes. What weapon do you favour? Um, rifle. Yes. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Uh, you're also a cricketer, so I won't ask you what you favour there, because it's only a bat and a ball, but uh, what is your strength in cricket? Oh, bowling. Uh, fast, fast bowling, yes. Fast bowling. Yes. The head of our photographic intelligence, he doesn't like cricket, so this is one of my few opportunities I have to talk. Heard. You have I heard have about heard. that, have you? Well, we won't go into that at great length because I've got a little test for you, actually. You see this strange thing that moves in front of you? Well, to open this door, you have to adjust the two dials on there and talk into the microphone so that it causes your voice to come out of the speaker. It's a synchronization test. Right. Is it sort of fairly clear what I've said to you? I think so. Right. Well, you've got 20 seconds to bring your own voice through that speaker from now. Right. This reminds me just a little of, um, if I may hark back to cricket, the scoreboard. Yes. Not, I would add, whilst batting, but the dial seemed to go around as quickly as this. That's right. I'm bowling. That's it. That's perfect. You've got there. Very well. There's a book. Anything... Uh, Strike you as being unusual about it? I don't think so. We're quite happy. For whom the bell tolls, Ernest M. Hemingway? Yes, you're quite happy with that. Um, perhaps Ernest Hemingway didn't write for whom the bells toll. No, I'm afraid he did write it, but he, he wrote it with a singular bell and a pluralistic tolls. And it also, actually, there's only one M in Hemingway. I think that even the person who printed it didn't Indeed. quite know that. Indeed. Uh, inside there's a piece of paper with your initials on it. Would you like to um, find it? Yes, you have indeed found it. And while you return to base with your chums over there, would you take the piece of paper and eat it? It is part of your mission. <laughs> and now for the night's assignment. Thank you, Money Packer. Major, Major. Espionage is a perilous game, particularly for the double agent who dices with death every time he tries to pass inside information. <coughs> The only person who knows a double agent is the man who pays him. The man who pays ours was eliminated at 2.27 this morning. This bookshop at Locarno in Switzerland fronted for his activities. In all, seven double agents used to visit that shop in order to pass state secrets or draw their pay. Now they must go somewhere else, but they're in mortal danger of their lives because the payroll list with their real identities on it is still hidden in the paymaster's shop. Your mission, quite simply, is to locate that list, memorize the names, and then destroy it without trace. All right? Money Packer, will you give them the reasons for their cover story? Certainly, Major. In order to get inside the bookshop without arousing suspicion, you will each assume the cover of a book collector. Now, the Swiss police are still investigating the paymaster's death, so your cover will be subject to their scrutiny. Now, if you have thoroughly acquainted yourself with your subject, you should have no trouble whatsoever in convincing them. But first, we'd just like to check that you can convince us. Agent Laurie, please prepare for interrogation. Five questions to be answered at speed and with complete conviction. Because even if a wrong answer is delivered with unspeakable, unshakable confidence, you will score points. Um, Treasure Island. When was that first published? 1883. Correct. Stevenson also wrote Catriona. What was it the sequel to? What would you like it to be the sequel to? The answer. Kidnapped. Absolutely correct. In Treasure Island, someone was accidentally ridden down by revenue men on the night of the attack on the Admiral Benbow. Who was he? He was a bad man, blind man, blind beggar, by the name of Pew. Exactly right, Blind Pew. On the back of the map showing the position of Captain Flint's treasure were two landmarks. One was a tall tree on the shoulder of Spyglass Hill. What was the other? The other was 
It turned out to be a skeleton. Yes. Which had been placed in a very particular manner with the arm pointing in the direction of the treasure. I'm sorry, Skeleton Island, so that was incorrect. What was last heard when what was last heard of Long John Silver? Oh, Long John just stole some of the treasure, which was eventually recovered, and disappeared. Wow. Um, he disappeared to, to back to his wife, whom he had left behind in good old England. No, I'm afraid he actually escaped ashore in South America, possibly leaving his good old wife back in good old England. <laughs> Agent Laurie has scored 15 out of a possible 25, plus two for confidence, which is a total of 17. Agent Hearn, would you take the chair? Peter Pan is your book. It was written by Sir James Matthew Barry. When was he born? Uh, 1896. No, he was born in 1860. What university was Barry educated at? Edinburgh. Correct. There was a nonconformist amongst Captain Hook's crew. Who was he? Uh, noodles. No, it was Smee. Smee gave pleasant names to everything, but what did he call his cutlass? Tickling... You're so Tickling. near, but it's actually Johnny Corkscrew, which could be very tickling, I'm certain. <laughs> Captain Hook is haunted by a fear that the clock swallowed by the crocodile will stop. Why does this worry him? Because then he won't know where the crocodile is. Absolutely correct. Agent Hearn has scored 10 out of a possible 25, plus two for confidence, which is a total of 12. Agent Harris, would you take the chair, please? For you, we have The 39 Steps by John Buchan. Now, Buchan was a peer. What was his title? First Baron Tweedsmuir. Correct. Between 1935 and 1940, what appointment did he hold? Governor General of Canada. Absolutely correct. In The 39 Steps, Richard Hannay offered sanctuary to a stranger who was later found with a knife through his heart. What name had the stranger used to announce himself? Scudder. Do you know his full name? Jim. No. Uh, I'll give you half and one for bluff. What was the name of the house at the head of the 39 steps? Trafalgar House. Very close. Three weeks after Hanny solved the mystery of the 39 steps, something momentous happened. What was it? The start of World War One. Correct. Agent Harris scored 20 plus one for confidence. <laughs> Agent Spencer, would you take the chair? Uh, your book is uh, Winnie the Pooh by A.A. A. Milne. What does the A.A. stand for? Alan Alexander. Correct. In 1930, Milne wrote a gripping play based on a famous book. What was the name of the play? Uh, would this be The Mystery at Red House? Something no, that Asia. sounds a bit like Agatha Christie. No, it's Toad of Toad Hall. In trying to steal some honey, Pooh tried to deceive the bees by using an elaborate disguise. What was this disguise? Uh, I believe he disguised himself as one of the bees indeed uh, and uh, took the honey from the pot. No, he disguised himself as a black cloud. Very close. <laughs> a deep pit was dug to trap a creature. What was the creature? Uh, would this be the he heffalump? That was a heffalump, all right. <laughs> Complete with the H. During the floods, a rescue operation was mounted to save Piglet. The rescue vessel was an upside-down umbrella. What was she named? I'm afraid I have she to go on that She was called the brain of Pooh. It's an unlikely name for an upside-down umbrella, yeah. I will admit. Agent Spencer has scored 10 out of a possible 25, plus 2 for confidence, which is a total of 12. <laughs> There's another hazard in tonight's mission which you may not have noticed. Unaware that their paymaster has been liquidated, any double agent on the Locarno list turning up at the shop could be walking into a trap. I'd like you to turn and face money, Packer. Thank you, Major. Standard security procedure requires that a double agent calls at the Locarno library, pictured, he pictured here, and picks up a pre-selected book by an author who is better known for his pen name than by his real name. This is a ground plan of the English section of the library. The books are arranged alphabetically under the author's surnames. Agent Laurie and Agent Hearn, would you like to take a chair in front of the ground map? Now, Agent Laurie, you're standing here, indicated by this light. 
Agent Hearn, you're standing here represented by this light, which moves in any direction if you move the lever in front of you. Just give it one tap and go back to the center. You're both waiting to warn a double agent, but you have no idea what he looks like. When he takes the book off the shelf, a third light will appear, and it will start moving towards one of these two exits, here and here. Now then, I can tell you that the book he's about to pick up was written by an author whose real name was Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Now that might give you a head start if you think. You can improve your rating by 10, the first one to intercept our double agent, and you can start moving now. Samuel Langhorn Clemens. And there's our third light, and of course it was Mark Twain. have intercepted our double agent. Well done, Agent Laurie. You've improved your rating by 10. Would you like to return to base? And can I have Agent Harris and Agent Spencer? Would you like to take a chair? Now we'll just see how you can do intercepting another double agent. Agent Harris, you're represented by this light here. And Agent uh, Spencer, you're standing here. Now remember, you can move in any direction by moving the lever in front of you. I can tell you that the book the double agent is going to pick up was written by an author whose real name is J.B. Morton. Now you can start moving as soon as you like. Our double agent has entered the library. Off you go. J.B. Morton. And there's our third light, and it's, of course, Beachcomber, better known as. Frantic bit of <gasps> operations going on there by Agent Harris. I know the feeling. There's a mad chase going on. <gasps> My God. It's all around the O's. Now, what's going to happen? There's going to be... And, <laughs> well done, Agent Spencer, a good bit of manoeuvring there. Yes, indeed. You've improved your rating by 10. Would you like to return to base? And turn around on your chair. And at this critical stage, we'll have a look at our computer indicator. And it's actually telling us that Agent Laurie is in the lead with 52. Agent Harris has 46. Agent Spencer has 43. And Agent Hearn has 37. Which means, I'm afraid, that Agent Hearn must be eliminated from tonight's assignment. Well, Hearn, we shall miss you. But so that you'll remember us, I'd like you to go over to Moneypacker. Agent Hearn, we'd like you to accept this very unique quartz clock radio. It uh, actually works off one battery for two years. It also gives FM and medium wave reception, and it's accurate within 15 seconds a month. Thank you for your brave efforts on the mission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three agents are left to complete the mission, but before they can go into the field, they must penetrate the disguise of this well-known undercover contact. If you think you know who it is, keep it yourself for a couple of minutes when we'll return with the master spy. <laughs> Nothing makes an undercover agent feel that he's doing it all wrong than somebody asking him for his autograph. So it involves a complicated disguise. But it is essential that our three surviving agents should know the man with whom they're dealing. This is their chance to establish his true identity. Would Agent X Kindly make his report. Gentlemen, ma'am, having now made a thorough search of the interior of the bookshop on the pretext of seeking an unexpurgated edition of Alice in Wonderland, I am satisfied 
that the Locarno list is not secreted within the pages of a book. However, I have made a motion picture which clearly shows that the shop is used as a secret rendezvous for half the agents of Anarchy International. Gentlemen, we must move fast or someone will wind up exceptionally dead. That's a very sound idea, but first of all, they must establish your true identity. Raymond Baxter. Cool. Uh, yes, uh, it seems to me that the gun has been beaten. Would you like to show yourself? Ha! Huh. Quick as a flash. Well, it makes a bit pointless, doesn't it, all this? Raymond thought he had a season at the National Theatre all lined well, up. Well, that's I mean, no. we all have our dreams. No. But, but you have brought back, in fact, uh, photographic evidence for us. Yes, I have. You yes, have a film. Yes, yes, I, right. I think my well, time now has that, been wasted. No, I'm certain that it has. Now that you know you're in good company, I'd like you to turn around on your stools, face the screen, listen and observe everything you see very carefully. Roll film. The shop itself is just off the Piazza Castello, and as I set up my camera to shoot out of the back window on my hired transit van, I spotted Carl Feisler, Anarchy International's man in Geneva. He was trying to read a newspaper the hard way. <laughs> just round the corner, doing her best to blend in with the scenery, Anna Gretchen, Feisler's number two, was making a big career out of selling no flowers. Here's an interesting development, this man I've never seen before. He's either one of theirs or one of those. See what I mean? <laughs> After he'd gone inside the shop, Feisler made his first move. He moves well, Feisler. Obviously, Anarchy International operate on the basis of waste not want not. Their expense allowance must be as low as ours. <laughs> Feisler was just about to go back and carry on with his paper reading act when something seemed to take him by surprise. It was this man with the library book in his hand. I zoomed in fast. Isn't George Eliot the pen name of a well-known author? Feisler watched the man go into the shop and then scurried across the front of it to his earlier position. I didn't like the way he held his hand under that newspaper. It reminded me of Bogart in a gangster picture. It was then I realized that the man who'd gone in with the library book was one of our double agents, and he was very good at running at the double as well. Which leaves one very interesting question. Who's this you've got minding the shop? Right, if you'd like to turn and face this way, I would like to ask you, Spencer, to tell us how you got Raymond so quickly. Voice, look, walk, what was it? Uh, I think it was the, uh, the intonation of the voice. <laughs> How soon did you get it? Pretty early on, but I was, I just wanted to make sure. Ah, I it see, was, it was worth risking the five points that you would have lost it. if you got it wrong. Well, Raymond, thank you very much for that very lucid report. Now, what's your next mission? I think I'd better go and look for a job which doesn't involve dressing up or disguising <laughs> my voice. <laughs> All you right, know. thank you. I wish my fellow agents good luck, better yes. luck than I had. All right, thank you, Raymond, very much. Thank you. Now we'll see how much you managed to observe of that film, both visually and through your ears. Now, starting with you, Agent Laurie, in which part of Locarno will you find the bookshop? Just off the Piazza Castello. What was the title of the double agent's library book? It was written by Thomas Elliot. What was it called? I'm afraid it was Mill on the Floss. We saw a young lady at the end of the film. What did she have in her hand? A feather duster. That's it. It was fairly unmistakable, wasn't it? Agent Harris, where was the contact hiding when he shot the film? At the back of the shop. No, in the back of a transit van. Why do we know that Pfizer wasn't really reading his newspaper? Because it was upside down. Correct. Where did Pfizer conceal the flowers? Inside his rink. Absolutely correct. Agent Spencer, what was the name of Carl Pfizer's number two? Sorry. Anna Gretchen. Now, Anna sold a bunch of flowers. Who finally ended up with them? Uh, she ended up with them herself. Absolutely correct. What did Pfizer do immediately after the double agent went inside the shop? 
He produced a gun from under his newspaper. Now, who remembers the paymaster's last words in his radio message? Somebody where would the, be very dead. Where the hell have they gone? No, the radio message at the very beginning. Do you remember? There was this urgent cry. What was the frantic cry? It was, where are they? no, peel the Ellis Bell. Oh. Now, peel the Ellis Bell. I'd like you to remember that very carefully, would you? All right? Because obviously, he was trying to tell us where the Locarno list was. Money Packer, could we have the latest ratings, please? Certainly, Major. Agent Laurie leads the field with 57, Agent Harris has 56, and Agent Spencer has 53. Which means, I'm afraid, that Agent Spencer must be eliminated from tonight's mission. And that up, Spencer. You nearly caught up, but I'm afraid not near enough. Sorry to lose you at this stage in the mission, but if you like to report to Money Packer, I think you'll think it was all worthwhile. Thank you. Agent Spencer, we'd like you to accept this Super 8 Cine camera with a power zoom and to enjoy your movies, this cassette-loading back projector, which makes viewing just about as easy as watching the Excellent. television. Thank you for Thank joining you us much. and all your efforts on this mission. Thank you very much. Again. Okay. Two agents will be on a flight to Switzerland. Only one of them will be using the return ticket. For your eyes only, read and digest. Remember, keep in radio contact with us. And if you don't find the Locarno list, you might just as well be on it yourselves. Good luck. Thank you, Major. Good luck. Thank you, Major. Where are they, Money Packer? We're behind schedule. They're in the bookshop, sir. We're moving towards the rare book section. <laughs> Any moment now, they should... Oh, there they are, sir. Ah, control to bookworm. We have a message for you. Once you've gained access to the rare book section, you must look for a book with a wrongly worded title. It'll be under the letter M. Agent Laurie, you have the highest current rating, so the option to proceed is yours. Um, would you both listen to me, agents? Just listen carefully. Agent Laurie, you have the highest ratings, so you must proceed first. If you make a mistake or falter, we shall stop you and Agent Harris will have the right to take over. Now you're clear to open the door. You have 15 seconds from now, Laurie. Coming, we're getting the door open very shortly. The door, just tune it into my voice with the, the number in code here, which must be the last one now. There's only one left. And that's it. Yes, the door must open now. Go in, Agent Harris. Right, Harris, you can come into the library and would you shut the door behind you? Right, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a spelling error. On what? The title of a rear book. No, no, what are you looking for? Under titles or under authors? Authors. Well, that is wrong. Take over, Harris. Titles or authors? Titles, beginning with M. Right, well, look for titles. You're in the wrong place, both of you. That's it. Speed is of the essence. The letter was M. Men and Superman. Yes, what should it be? Man and Superman. Right, take the book out. What should you be looking for? The name inside. Which I eat. No. Uh, 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 Which I don't eat. Take over, would you, Laurie? I'm glad she didn't eat it. You might actually want to refer to it. We'd have to resort to x-rays, then. I'm going to destroy it. Are you? Yep. Well, you're wrong, too. Pass it back to Harris. <laughs> now, Harris, before you get your gnashes going, what are you going to do? Read it. It says Emily Bronte on it. Right. Now, continue. What are you going to do now? Look for a book by Emily Bronte. Under what? Oh, under B. No, um, under... Ooh. Yes, un under B of what? Of authors. That's right. Keep going. What book are you going to select? Now, think about it. Wuthering Heights. Very good. You picked the right one. That was your sister who read Jane Eyre. Now, what are you going to do? Look for another piece of paper. But why? Now you've got... Because I'm looking for the list. 
Yes, now what is the clue to the list? Peel the Ellis Bell. What does that mean? Oh, that was her sister. Um, no, what do you mean it was her sister? Be specific. Ellis Bell was a pseudonym. For who? For Emily Bronte. Very good. Now what are you going to do? Oh. <laughs> I'll give you ten seconds to think it out. What are you going to do? I've got to peel, take the book apart. Uh, wrong, wrong, hand it over, hand it over. You were so close. Now, what are you going to do? I've no idea. I'm going to look for, uh, for more names in here. Are you? Yeah. Now, while he's doing that, Harris, think what you'd be doing. In case he does it wrong. Okay, Harris, he is doing it wrong, so what are you going to do? Look for the dedication. The dedication to what? <laughs> the front of them. Would you restate the radio message? Peel the Ellis Bell. What does the first word peel mean? Peel. To strip. Yes. So if I strip the cover off. What would that do? From where? From where? I found the list! <laughs> oh, my thing, you're there. <laughs> Very good. Now what are you going to do? I have to remember all the names. Excellent. Then what are you going to do? Oh. When you've remembered the names, what are you going to do? Eat it. Eat the list. Excellent. Right. You've done it. In that case, Harris, go and start eating. You've completed the mission. You need only to return to base by the fastest possible means. And we'll have something waiting to cure your indigestion. <laughs> Would you like to move, move over to the far side of the library, keep going, to, and find Arma's Almanac down to your right. But now stop there. Arma's Almanac. To the right is a section of books, right? To the right of Arma's Almanac are about six books. I'd like to take those down, and behind, you'll find a battery or mains powered portable television, <laughs> so that you need not miss your favorite program wherever you go. Thank you, Agent Laura, for your brave efforts in this mission. Thank you. Harris, that was a superb exhibition at the end. You came up from being just behind and winning. Congratulations Thank on becoming you. the master spy. Money packer? So that you have all knowledge at your fingertips for all your future missions, we'd like you to accept the splendid British 20-volume encyclopedia. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. We hope you'll join us again next week for another assignment of The Master Spy.